Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan, the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent licensed in all 50 states. So glad that you joined us on all major podcast platforms and the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel where you can see me and the lovely guests interacting and our facial expressions, et cetera, especially when I say something and they disagree and they just kind of grimace and roll their eyes, et cetera. Today's guest is a superstar rock star and uh, she has graced our presence once before and I hope this isn't the last time, hope to not offend her. But you know, I, occasionally I get calls that say, you know, I want somebody really smart with a high IQ that has a very uh, extensive background that's creative, that has a good team around her. But here's the key, Stan, I need them to write a Harley Davidson. Now, that last part typically eliminates most people, but not this person. Welcome back to Fun with Annuities, Dana Onspock. Dan, I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> I should have rode my Harley into the office just to record. I could do a little vroom vroom right now. Next time, well, that's, that, that'd that be kind of like Judas Priest, the rock band, you know, they ride that Harley on stage. I know I'm dating myself a little bit, but uh, maybe the next time you wear the leather jacket, you know, with the uh, sensible yeah. money, sensiblemoney.com logo and the juicing on the sleeve, you know? I'll see if I can get a special bandana made. I like it. <laughs> Hey, I wanted to get you on because I don't, at the time of this tape and everybody look at the date. So if you're looking at it two years from now, this is why we're talking about it. There's a few things going on, Dana, and I wanted to get a rational level-headed approach to a lot of things that are happening. But um, I wanted to start off a long time ago. I think you had a, I was kind of doing some research and we always do this on you, even though you don't know that. That's the reason I knew about the Harley Davidson. But um, I think you had a blog that was called Don't Blame the Hammer but I wanted to lead into that because I thought that was neat because I always think annuity, annuity agents, most of them are hammers looking for nails. Um, yeah. please, don't, please don't be the nail. But the key word and the one word I want to throw at you overhand with a run you start is the word biases. Can you jump into what we're going into and what people can get? They can be, they can be victim of biases from, from agents, advisors, RIAs, masters of the universe. Yeah, absolutely. So I see this, I mean, I've been practicing 27 years and you'll be in a conversation with a client and bring up something, a stock, an annuity, a reverse mortgage, bonds, and suddenly they will react to one of these words like it was a four letter word. Mm -hmm. And you'll think, what just happened? And so I wrote this blog post called Don't Blame the Hammer. And in it, I used the story of somebody that was trying to put a screw in the wall and they were pounding on it with a hammer and it didn't work and it made a big mess and the drywall was everywhere and the screw wouldn't stay in the wall and mm -hmm. they were yelling and saying, hammers don't work and I'm never going to buy a hammer again. I'm never going to use a hammer again. When really they just had the wrong tool for the job. And maybe they weren't, edu weren't educated on even how to use a hammer or how to put a screw in the wall. That could be the problem too. When you're not educated, it's easy to use the wrong tool for the job because you don't really know what the tool does and what it's for. And I encounter that, I've encountered it so many times over the years with people who, maybe they had a bad experience in the stock market. So they say, mm -hmm. stocks don't work, I'll never buy stocks again. Maybe they heard something about annuities, that annuities are, are horrible and you lose all your money or you can't touch your money. And so they say annuities, oh, you know, I would never use those. Right. We see it with reverse mortgages where we bring up this concept of a reverse mortgage. And as I was thinking about this podcast today, I thought about, you know what? I will probably most definitely use a reverse mortgage one mm -hmm. day. And, and I'd love to, you know, if we get into it, explain to the readers why. We see it with bonds where people say, well, interest rates are going to go up. I shouldn't own any bonds. So we see it all the time. And those are biases that can inhibit us from making the most optimal decisions for our finances. How do people guard against that, though? Because, 
you know, we all have what's called confirmation bias in all forms of our life, whether it's political or, or if someone say, give me a good example, if they're a Florida Gator, they just think all Gators are great. I wouldn't know who I was talking about there, <laughs> Dana, but uh, Dana went to UF. So um, how, do, how do people, in, when it comes to their money, guard against those biases coming at them and they might not know it is a bias? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is raising awareness, right? Thinking, how do I view all of these financial instruments as simply tools, not as a bad tool? So how do we avoid the label, this is bad and this is good? And simply approach it the way we might approach a tool in our garage is, you know, what does it do? Well, we all know, I mean, I'm not a handy person, but I still know you have the right tool for the job. It works much better than mm -hmm. if you are trying to use the wrong tool. So getting curious, you know, why mm -hmm. are there so many annuities? Why mm -hmm. is a reverse mortgage for? Mm -hmm. What is the appropriate use for bonds? So I think that curiosity really can, can help people avoid falling into the bias trap and Stepping back and thinking about, I, I see so many media articles that will be slanted toward a certain view. And, you know, you can see things, for example, you know, you should buy gold, you should, you know, do this, you should do that. And that advice is appropriate for someone, but not for everyone. <laughs> so understanding who might the audience be. Is it a corporate audience? So the way that companies have to manage their investment portfolios or a pension plan might manage theirs is very different than the way an individual might need to manage. So some of the things that we read out there aren't necessarily written for our household. They don't know our age, our, mm. you know, our, our, our financial situation, our tax rate, when we want to retire, our family situation. So you have to be cautious and, and realize, you know, those biases can come because it was good advice for someone and that someone isn't you. Well, and in my world, I just made it very simple to take out the bias. We just buy contractual guarantees and shop all carriers. In your process, what I like about your process uh, with you and your team is it's very, very pragmatic. It's very, very um, detailed and non-rushed. Can you go into that a little bit about how your system strips away those biases? Yeah, so we are self-professed retirement income geeks. And yes. So one of the challenges I had when I started in this career in 1995 was, you know, people would ask you questions like, should I pay off my mortgage or invest the money? Should I buy term insurance or whole life? Should I use a reverse mortgage? Should I buy this annuity? We didn't have any way to quantify the answer. And I started off working for, it was a great company, but it was a sales organization. And so they would train you to explain to the client how you could earn a higher rate of return by doing right. this versus that. Right. But there was never any mathematical analysis and, and it really bugged me. And so I went on my own deep dive of becoming a fee only planner and building our own spreadsheet models so that we could take these answers and turn them into a, an analysis, a set of, we call them our retirement readiness tests. They're not really tests, they're guidelines, but if you, you know, exceed certain parameters, we feel 100% confident that your plan will work without further adjustment. And if you don't exceed a certain set of parameters, then there's just a higher probability that somewhere along the way, you might have to spend a little less or work another year or, or make some type of adjustment. And so within those parameters, when we build in an annuity into a, a client's financial plan. We can quantify, did it increase certain metrics? One of those is what we call a coverage ratio. Mm -hmm. Did it increase their fundedness? So much like a pension plan produces a report each year that shows its fundedness level, we have a report or an analysis we do on our clients each year that shows us how funded their retirement plan is to support their future cash flows. And so you can build in the use of these different tools and did it increase these metrics? Do they look better? Did it improve them or not? And so it gives us a more mathematical way to say, here's why we would be making this recommendation. Here's what it does for you. And it's not all measured in terms of rate of 
return. There's other risks. We face the risk of running out of money, of living long. We don't think of that as a risk, but living long is a risk in, in financial mm -hmm. terms. Uh, there's the security of the income we might have. People experience cognitive decline as they get older and they can do strange things with their money. So if they have a baseline of guaranteed income or decisions that have been made ahead of time, it can help protect them from them. So it's, it's a metrics-based process that we use. It is very detailed, but it also looks at, at things from a viewpoint that's broader than just how do we increase your rate of return. We're talking to Dana Onspach, the pride of Scottsdale, Arizona, and Gainesville, Florida at the same time. Um, cognitive decline, Dana. I mean, this is, a, this is an issue that's tough to bring up with those A personality clients because they're, already, they're hitting on 12 cylinders. They're, they're, they're like, yeah. it's hard to convince them that they have to plan for that um, or they have to realize that their spouse or significant other isn't as into the financial um, plan as they are and they need to have a continuation plan, not just if they, you know, something happens to them if their Learjet hits the mountain, as I say, but if they start not hitting on all cylinders, how do you tiptoe into that tough conversation with your clients? How does your team do that? You know, we probably don't tiptoe. <laughs> <laughs> You're the We're hammer. Like, you know. <laughs> okay. Here it is. This is something we need to plan for. Um, I find most people who are working with financial advisors have a, a, a level of awareness around this already. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons they want that relationship in place earlier in retirement is once you have a trusted advisor, it becomes a lot easier to rely on them as cognitive decline sets in mm -hmm. versus if you've met older people, they can be distrusting when cognitive decline sets in of new people. Mm -hmm. So when you have that trusting relationship in place, you know, we do see that people will realize we have their best interests at heart. And as we're giving them advice later in life, they, they will accept it. And they often introduce us to other family members and give mm -hmm. us permission to reach out to them if there's anything that we see. But it, so, so we bring it up right from the beginning and we find the type of person we typically work, work with is, is amenable to it. For the people who resist the idea, I mean, you just have to think about some of the people you know, maybe family members that you've seen. We have a, a story here. So we have a client we've been working with since 2010. And the husband is our, our, the primary person that interacts. The wife has joined the meetings maybe once or twice over 10 years. He had a series of two strokes last mm. year. Mm -hmm. and we could not get a hold of her. She wouldn't respond. Mm. And finally, I'm sure she was dealing with a lot. You know, sure. we made sure everything was still happening and their retirement paychecks were getting deposited to them. But when we finally did get a hold of her, she still at, at that age was like, well, you know, why do we have so much cash in our bank account? She didn't know in, in their checking account. Mm -hmm. We don't control their normal banking checking account. And why, you know, do you guys pay our bills? Do you pay my bills for me? Mm. And, and we don't. And so when you realize, you know, now what were we able to do? We were, we were asking who's helping you. And she said her daughter was coming in town. So we were able to set up a conference call with the daughter and the wife and help them understand, like, here's what we do. And your daughter can help you with the bill pay. And here's why your husband wanted the extra cash in the checking account. It was I mean, we love when we get to, to really be there for our clients in these situations. That wouldn't have happened if that, that trusting relationship hadn't been in place for a decade ahead of this event. Steve Pierce was on my podcast a while back, and he calls, he calls the, the three levels of cognitive decline. And he, I don't think he came up with it, but he's promoted it really well. And I, I asked permission to use it from him. He calls it go, go, slow, go, and no, go. And yes. you've, all, you've all heard of that, but I think that's a very succinct way to put it to people. There's a lot of people in the go-go world right now, but you, there will be slow go. And for all you people over 50 that said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, active. And, and once you hit 50, you're like, wait a minute, I'm not as active. It's the same, it's the same thing, but with 10,000 baby boomers hitting age 65 every single day, I think this is something in the financial planning world and the financial world in general 
that needs to be addressed. Obviously, you don't go into the meeting and go, you're going to lose it eventually, Jim, so we need to get something together. You don't do that. That's probably the way I do it. But um, I think it's part of the overall financial plan, whereas in the past, I don't think that was something that was discussed. We just It's one of those things where you just dealt with it when it happened, and I'm hearing from you and your team you're, you're talking about it day one, whether they're 50, 55, 62, 65, 70, it doesn't matter. We're talking about what's the continuation plan here, correct? Yeah, yeah, you are, because we've seen things that happen. You know, we had another client who they had a life insurance policy. Actually, it wasn't our client. It was their parents. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the client called us, you know, wanting to know if there's anything we could do. This life insurance policy had been canceled literally two months before I think one of the parents passed mm -hmm. because they just missed the premium notice. So they were in their eighties and the mail came and they didn't pay it and they didn't want to set it up on automatic payment. And, and so we've seen things like that, that could have been mm -hmm. avoided. I'll tell you another situation I just had last year. So I have a client couple uh, the husband uh, is younger than the wife by, uh, mm -hmm. I think, about eight years. And he had a $50,000 life insurance policy on her. And the premium was going up, which mm -hmm. happens later in life. Sure. And he called me and he wanted to cancel it. And I think it was going up by $200 a month. And he just didn't want to pay it. Well, she had been quite ill and uh, was hospice had, had been called. And he would have canceled that policy. And I said, no, we need to keep that policy and mm -hmm. we're going to send you the extra money to pay the premium. But given her current health situation, I don't think you should cancel it. Mm -hmm. And within three months she passed. Okay. And that would have been $50,000. He would have just walked away from because right. that ability to measure out an extra $200 a month. And some of it's just human. He didn't want to face the reality that she might pass. Right. You know, you know, you have to relate to that sense, like somebody doesn't want to face that reality. And by paying that premium and thinking of it in logical terms, you're sort of saying, well, you know, these are the odds. They don't want to think of that in terms of, of you know, a payoff. Of course, nobody wants to think of that in those terms. But that is our job is to say, you know, we understand you're super emotional, but here's why you need to, to keep that policy. And at the time of this taping, just, just in the past few days, Bruce Willis, the actor, has retired from acting because of cognitive decline. And um, so, you know, if you think of Bruce Willis, you think of he's vibrant and he's funny and he's sharp and, you know, but, you know, things catch up and things happen. So because things happen, you have to have a financial plan in place. I do like the fee only structure because you guys are sitting on the same side of the table as as them um and i always always think that's the i always tell people find a fee only planner and you say wait a minute stan you're your commission yes i am a commission guy um but i'm a different one i know you're saying sure you are no seriously i am um because we're only talking about contractual guarantees and it has to fit and it has to be in proportion and allocation um i always talk about you know, there was always fake financial news before there was fake news. So Trump didn't come up with anything. And I think the fake financial news um, that we're seeing and, and continue to see and will continue to see ongoing leads into those biases as well. Um, can you comment a little bit about what you're seeing out there? The typical CNBC, Fox News, Fox Business type thing, the business channels and Bloomberg, those are you know, those are, cal you can calculate that. You kind of can see the ads coming and, and the agendas. It's the other stuff that's, that's getting into social media and very subtly pushing people to biases that are sales driven. What's your take on that? And how do people try to filter that out as well? Because seniors are on social media, whether people think they are or not. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen it in the financial social media as much, but I have seen things that people in my life whom I trust and admire and who are highly intelligent mm -hmm. thought were true. And right. I said, 
no, like that is a fake screenshot. And I was able to go prove it to them. Wow. But I have seen so many things like that. And there was a course I was just reading about, I don't know if it came out of Wharton or Columbia, where there's a professor now training people on, you know, I don't want to call it how to spot fake news, but how to be, how to interpret your social media feed, how to spot things that aren't true and, mm -hmm. and actually teaching people, how do you go verify the source? Are there links to the source? You know, what are some red flags that would lead you to think that this was, you know, f fictitious. And so there is a ton of that out there, a ton of it. I, I know. And it's unregulated but, because there's so much of it and um, there's no way to regulate that, which I always tell people just, just be very careful. Don't go looking for the perfect product. And if you do go looking for it, someone's going to find it for you and sell it to you. <laughs> it they are. And it, doesn't gonna, it, it doesn't exist. And I see this, especially in my industry, the life insurance and annuity industry is, is just, you know, they're, oh. they're trying to sell people a product that they think solves for everything. And they tell them that it does in order to get the sale. And it's just an, un, unfortunately, it's just hard to regulate it. I don't blame the carriers because they put out the contracts. It's just the agent of uh, army agent out there that's pushing it yeah. with their own agendas. Scottsdale, Arizona, Arizona is rife with that. Obviously Florida is a melting pot of those kind of grifters and sociopaths that sell that. But I just tell people all the time, there's no, there's no quick fix. There's no pill to get skinny and have six pack abs and there's no, per <laughs> and there's no perfect, if there was, I'd take it. And there's no perfect product as well, which leads me to the kind of the next thing I want you to, you mentioned it earlier and I had Wade Fowl on recently and he's obviously written a book on, on reverse mortgages. But I think when people like you start talking about reverse mortgages, I think, I think smart people in the room kind of go, oh, they do the Scooby-Doo, they go, Roar! because that's the wild, wild west when it comes to marketing and things like that. But there is a place for reverse mortgages, can you kind of go into your research and what you have come up with from an advice standpoint when it comes to reverse mortgages? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of people think of the reverse mortgage as a last minute resort. I don't know, well, even last minute, last, you know, you're, you don't have any other options. Only bullet in the gun, right, yeah. exactly. But there's so many advantages in general, what we like to do in many cases is preserve home equity for potential long-term care costs later in life. Mm -hmm. If you're going to need to be in a facility, you're probably going to sell your home and that equity can, can be used to, to help cover your care costs. So in general, that, that's our approach. Now, a lot of our clients have long-term care insurance, so they have a lot of those costs covered already. Mm -hmm. And then we don't need to preserve the home equity for that. And a reverse mortgage is... Okay, you know, some of the basics, it can be used starting at, I believe it's age 62. Generally, you have to have at least 50% equity in your home. But let's say someone had a $400,000 or $300,000 property and a $150,000 mortgage remaining at 65. In many cases, you can use a reverse mortgage to simply eliminate your current mortgage. Now, by eliminate, no, you're not getting rid of the mortgage, right? But mm -hmm. instead of making payments to the mortgage and having a $150,000 balance that goes down a little bit each year, it's like the payment you would have made accrues onto the mortgage and you have a slightly larger balance each year. Now, people somehow look at this as, you know, like the bank can take their home. There's still this, this perception mm -hmm. out there, but it doesn't work that way. If there is, so let's say you did this for a few years and you didn't have a mortgage payment and your home appreciates and your mortgage balance also appreciates. So it's several years later and your home's worth more, but now your mortgage balance is at 250,000. It started at 150. You pass or decide to sell the home. You sell the home, the remaining equity is still yours. Mm -hmm. You pass, the remaining equity still goes to your heirs. So if your goal is to maximize cash flow, right? I want to have cash flow. And this is why I said I would probably use a reverse mortgage. I don't have children. Why would I want to preserve my home equity to pass along to someone? I'd rather maximize my cash flow. Mm -hmm. So I can enter retirement with a mortgage, use a reverse mortgage to eliminate it. And, you know, I'd rather have that money to travel and spend and do some fun things in retirement. Even if I do have children, mentally, 
we tend to bucket things, right? I want the house to be go here. I want mm-hmm. this to go there. If we instead think about this as a big jigsaw puzzle and think about these different pieces and how do I put them together in the way that's going to accomplish the picture that's most important to me. And for many people, having a comfortable retirement lifestyle is important and leaving assets to heirs is secondary, right? Yes, I want to be comfortable and yes, it would be nice to to leave something. And so Mm -hmm. reverse mortgages can fit very well into those situations too, to free up cash flow so that you can go out, especially during your go-go years. You brought up those, Mm -hmm. you know, gosh, we see that in real life with every one of our clients, early retirement, they're traveling and active. And Mm -hmm. usually by by mid seventies, sometimes early seventies, about the time required minimum distributions begin, people slow down. They, they slow down, they don't spend as much. So you want to front load that spending during those go-go years, if that's the, the likely path and, mm-hmm. and reverse mortgages and many other things are all tools that, that can help you do that. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but reverse mortgages, we talk about that conceptually. I'm assuming if people contact you at sensiblemoney.com, that's all one word, sensiblemoney.com. And again, we're going to have a full page for Dana on my site so that you can access that so you don't have to scramble for a pencil. Do you have sources that you have vetted, you and your team have vetted and trust for these reverse mortgage process if someone wants to do that? We have some local ones, but it really depends on your state. And so you're required to go through a counseling session, which I think does a disservice to a reverse mortgage. That's but weird. I didn't know that, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the you know it's it's a government backed program, and they basically yeah. say they want and well, I guess it's not so horrible. Here I am talking about the need for education, right? <laughs> so they want you to go through education to really understand what it is and how it works. And so actually, that does make sense, but that scares some people off too to think what I have to go through a counseling session. Sure. should be called an education session. You know, how does a reverse mortgage (laughs) work? Counseling is probably not the right (laughs) word to promote this. It would be a informative fact finding meeting. Yes, but that is required. And so oftentimes you're going to want someone in your state and and that's going to offer the reverse mortgage program. Now, sometimes we can help you vet that person, Okay. uh, but but usually you're going to want someone in your state. Since it is a government-backed program, there are a lot of reputable uh, banks and mortgage lenders that offer it because it's very low risk to them. Mm -hmm. Very, very low risk. Yes, there's fees like any mortgage, uh, but the government has basically said, hey, if the home has less equity than the mortgage, we're going to pick up the difference. So the bank has no risk. And mm-hmm. as a consumer, that's great on you. If your house should be underwater, you don't, you're not carrying that risk now. You still get your monthly mm-hmm. income along the way. And if there is equity in the home, then great. The mortgage gets paid off and you or your heirs get to keep it. I've got to ask you this because I'm sure your head, you're, you're, you, when you're riding your Harley and you're wearing your helmet, your helmet just blew off when you heard it. The proposal, which I don't think will pass, about taxing unrealized capital gains. I'm, I know for billionaires, but they always come down mm-hmm. below that. Can you say on a scale of one to 10 how dumb that is? Oh, oh, is 10 the <laughs> dumbest it could be? That's the dumbest <laughs> thing, Dana. I can't imagine being a president and, and someone handing me that card to read and then I read it. That, I, I don't, that just tells you how out of touch and money greedy those people are because that's the stupidest thing. And I think if that ever passed, I think me and you immediately retire and go ride Harleys, correct? Yeah, it would be, you know, and so (laughs) I I recently read something else. Now this was on Twitter by somebody reputable on Mm. Twitter, but I haven't verified it. Okay. But their take was that the media, surprise, surprise, had sort of blown this proposal out of proportion. Duh. And yeah. so that there is a, I think, mark to market requirement for certain dealers or institutions. Yes. And so all they were doing was looking at 
implementing that for institutions for certain digital assets also, and that perhaps the media took it and ran with it and mm. thought that it would apply to everyone, and that didn't seem to be the intention. I haven't verified any of this, but would it surprise me that the media might take something and blow it out of proportion? No, that wouldn't surprise me at all. The surprise to me is is the handlers and the supposed smart people around the president allowing him to even utter it and have people translate it that they yes. went. There's no way that was a win when you said it. There was just, there was no, unless, you know, the person out there going, yeah, let's get Elon Musk. You know, I understand those kind of, you know, class envy sentiments, but um, people always need to remember if they're, if they're going after billionaires, guess who's next? It's yeah. You. Yeah. So I, yeah. I mean, it would be ridiculous to tax unrealized gains. <laughs> like, like I said, I mean, ridiculous. that's when you text me, guys, hey, Stan, I'm out. You know, we're going to drive, well, drive, drive the bike. Think about, right, some of the, the things around corporate earnings, right? Sure. When a, we have a publicly traded company and there's this concern. They're so focused on short-term thinking and corporate earnings mm -hmm. and the next earnings statement that they make decisions that don't help the company in the long term. Well, mm -hmm. if you're taxing unrealized gains, you're going to have to sell assets to pay the taxes. And now you have people thinking short-term, short-term trading, short-term holding times. They're not thinking about the long-term potential of the asset. That is not good for anybody. It's not good. Well, and, and this is a direct reflection of what happened during COVID and, and giving away the money and the fraud that went, I mean, the fraud that we're hearing about and me and you both knew was happening. Um, it's just horrific. But can you comment on the numerous black swan type events that are happening with, with Russia invading, um, interest rates supposedly rising, gas prices at, at ridiculous highs? Um, I could keep going. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, you have a system in place with you and your team that's pragmatic, et cetera, but I guarantee you people are calling. What are you telling people here at this point in time when they're, panicking just a tad. Yeah, we've been lucky. We we did get a few calls when the, the Russia invaded Ukraine, mm -hmm. with people who wanted to move their money around and, you know, should we be doing something? I know there's that sense to think I should be doing something. But when you can step back, mm -hmm. study the statistics, study the numbers, we have been through many events like this. We've been through world wars. We've been through the Great Depression. We've been through peak oil prices, peak inflation in the 80s. There's all kinds of things that have happened. And so what's going on right now, we don't really view as a black swan event. It was, you know, a confluence of things that have happened that are okay. causing supply chain disruptions and inflation. And it has happened before. And it will smooth out. So when we think about mm -hmm. the last 10 years up until this past year, we had significantly below average inflation. And so if we had a decade of above average inflation, when I step back and I look at the 20 year view, I'm still within the long-term projections or averages that, that we might use. And when we're looking at financial plans, we're looking at the long view. And we get so focused on what does our account statement say today? Mm -hmm. And we're concerned with how do we manage this portfolio of assets and things that you own to deliver a reliable stream of cash flow over potentially 30 or more years in retirement. It is a very different answer. If I'm a, a bank that needs to mark my assets to market and has certain requirements to, to report, I might need my balance sheet to stay X at the end of every quarter. So it mm -hmm. might be really important what my account balance says today. But for a consumer that needs cash flow over 20 or 30 years, that shouldn't be the primary measuring metric. It, it makes us focus on the wrong thing. The ability to deliver sustainable cash flow is the primary metric. Mm -hmm. That's why annuities can be a great addition you wouldn't put all your money in it, but when you start to layer in guaranteed cash flow mm -hmm. to other types of assets, it actually can increase the security of your portfolio, the sustainability. Correct. It can help you weather all kinds of risks. So people look at the wrong metrics and the media, of course, stirs us up. The media sure. needs page views. And if they can trigger our emotions, right, 
they can cause us. I don't know if you've, have you seen the uh, Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma? Yes. Disturbing. Yes. Very disturbing. So yes. it knows if you stay on an article longer. So certain types of headlines mm -hmm. that you stirred up and mm -hmm. you, you start to think, oh, no, I need to do something with my money. It will send you more and more of those headlines. And it becomes this loop that feeds on itself. Right. And so that benefits the media. They get paid. The more page views, the more advertising dollars they get. So it's not, they're not aligned with what's in our best interest. The way that they share information and how they share it to us, it's not aligned. No doubt. What's new for, for Dana and Sensible Money? Um, I know that you're always trying to, as Gretzky said, skate where the puck's going to be and not behind the puck. And what are you, what are you doing with the firm and yourself um, going forward? Because I know you're always learning. You're a consummate learner, which was what I really like about you. You're always, not that you need any more education. You don't. You've forgotten more than most people ever know. The point is, that's your passion. What are you doing right now with, with you and the firm? Yeah, great question. So at year end, we started the first round of my own succession plan. So I had owned 100% of sensible money. But you're 25, Dana. How's that, <laughs> how's that even possible? You know, I turned 50 last year. And when you were saying you slowed down <laughs> at 50, I was thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just took a pickleball. Oh, um, you're a pickleball. You're a pickleball Harley Davidson. Okay, there's yes. my new introduction for you next time. There you go. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So new success. So you're, what's, I, I mean, your legacy is in place, obviously, but what's the, uh, what's the plan? Yeah, so I own 100 or did own 100% of Sensible Money, and mm -hmm. I have looked and get approached by firms all the time to yeah. acquire us, and I have, you know, been down the path to look at a few of those, but felt like we would lose a lot of what makes our firm special and lose our ability to customize the work that we do, mm -hmm. and so... Your other option is to, you know, sell internally, to build an internal succession program. And mm -hmm. so that's what we did. We created a partnership track and many years actually started talking about it five years ago. And so two of the people in our firm, CJ Miller and Amy Shepard, each bought 5% from me. So I still own the remaining 90% of the firm. And our plan is to continue that by selling small increments so that by the time I'm 70, I will be down to about 51, 52% ownership. Sure. And at that point, you can usually get bank financing to, to sell out the rest. So we will have likely other people in the firm who will also join sure. as owners. And it's been awesome. It's a huge relief on me. Uh, many of our clients even would ask, you know, what's going to happen to the firm? Right if something happens to you. Now I had a buy sell in place. Mm -hmm. I, I did everything you're supposed to do because one of my nightmares was always like something would happen to me and the headlines would say, you know, financial planner didn't do her own planning. <laughs> so <laughs> I, did, I didn't want that. So, no, you don't want that. No. So I've always, you know, made sure all the right things were in place, but this feels really good to me. It, it, it's a huge stress off my own shoulders to know that there's very, very capable people who could step in if something did happen to me. Now, I love what I do. I love helping and develop young people and growing the firm and the profession. So I plan to be here for the long term. But it's really nice to know if something should happen, we're, we're covered. Anything the firm's doing from a technology or processes standpoint, I know you're very high tech, uh, which I love. Um, anything new on the horizon? Or are you guys just blocking and tackling with what you have? Right now we're blocking and tackling, you know, in terms of figuring out how to free up some of my capacity. That's what mm -hmm. I'm working on right now. So the second half of the year, I do have some technology projects that we want to work at to look at some better ways to, to make the way we gather and share information more efficient. Right now in the financial services industry, it's been this way for a decade or more. There's so many different places you have to put information and they don't talk to each other seamlessly. And it's, it's a constant struggle and it creates inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. It makes it harder to train and hire people because they have to learn so many different things and mm -hmm. harder to share the information with the client in a seamless way. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement in that, that when I can free up some of my time to really look at some of the tools that are out there, that that's what's next for us in the second half of this year. 
is that your passion now because you're kind of taking a little bit more of an um, oversight view is trying to make sure the process is even better than it is, which is, I'm sure it's hard to do, but is that what you're always looking at? It is my passion. You know, right now we have a wait list. So we have so many people inquiring for our services mm -hmm. that we cannot keep up. And so when you see that, I think what we do is so valuable and that's why we have a wait list. And, mm -hmm. and people tell us all the time it was the best decision they made and the best money they've spent. And so then it's, well, how do I hire and train enough people and scale so that we can keep up with the demand that's out there? Right. And in order to do that, we have to be efficient and improve the processes without sacrificing quality. So in that's the past- That's hard. That sounds easy, but that's really hard. It's super hard. You know, we've had people in the past that asked if we could lower our pricing and we looked at it and we said, well, what should we leave out? As a team, we thought- in order for this to take less time, in order to reduce pricing, it would have to mm -hmm. take less time. What can we leave out? And we thought, no, this is too important. All of right. these topics we cover are too important to one of the biggest decisions you make, which is retirement. One of the biggest financial decisions, if not the biggest financial decision you ever make. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we said, no, we don't want to leave anything out. And obviously people are starting to see the value in that. And so, yes, we, have to make it more efficient without sacrificing quality and we have to make it easier to get new people up to speed and right now it's not easy uh, for them to get up to speed our process is very technically complex and so they will train with us for a year before they can really start to do things on their own without having someone double check everything for the person that wants to get on that waiting list i'm assuming there's a process for that but if they won't i think you had a newsletter that you offered or, or some obviously a lot of videos and writings, et cetera. How can people interact without becoming a client and get on that? How do they get on that waiting list? Yeah. So they would go to our website, sensiblemoney.com mm -hmm. and you can sign up for our newsletter at the bottom. And we don't send you any extra ads. We don't right. add you to anyone else's subscriber list. We're right. big on that. You can unsubscribe anytime. Sure. Uh, but in that newsletter, we, we typically send it out about once a month. And we also will announce free webinars that we offer. So we've got one coming up in June on sure. how to make a retirement spending plan. We usually do about five to six webinars per calendar year that are always free. We put the recordings on YouTube so you can find our YouTube channel, which is Sensible Money. And we'll, also, link, we'll link to that as well on, on our page. So absolutely. Yeah. We have a ton of free classes on there, a lot of content on there. And then there's also a schedule a consult button all over on our website. There's three reports you can download. But the schedule of consult takes you to a set of pre-meeting questions. And if you do want to get on the waiting list, you would fill those out. And I would, would write you back and let you know what our current wait time is. Mm -hmm. We're recording this on April 1st. Mm -hmm. And um, right now we have a wait list and we're going to start reaching out on April 18th. So right after tax season, we get extra busy during tax season. So mm -hmm. we need our time to be highly responsive to our current clients. And sure. so- We've put a hold on, on everything. And if you were our client, you would appreciate that. You would say, wow, Absolutely. that's great. Yeah. Tell people about your book. So my book, uh, Control Your Retirement Destiny, I first wrote in 2012 and then updated it. I think it was about 2016, 17. Mm -hmm. uh, would love to get a, a third edition out there, but I keep being concerned that with the changes to the required minimum distributions and more yeah. changes that every time I write it, it gets outdated. So, <laughs> you know, I'd love a period of certainty before I update it, but. Uh, so wait a minute, you're looking for a period of certainty <laughs> in Washington, DC. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Good. Okay, great. Yeah. So once again, sensiblemoney.com, <laughs> not sensible right. politics, sensiblemoney.com. Exactly. <laughs> sensible politics is too much to hope for too much. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, t yeah. Tell them about the book. I'm, I'm sorry. Keep yeah. Going. So we've had several professors tell us they use it uh, to mm -hmm. teach their class financial planning. So it's been very well received. It's got fantastic reviews, but it walks you through all of the different topics we've talked about. So we talk about annuities and reverse mortgages mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. different tools and different metrics you can use and how to make a retirement spending plan. 
And then I also have a course on uh, the great courses. So it's a lecture series that's out there and that was produced and, and, and released at the end, basically January 1st of 2021. And so it is a little bit more life cycle oriented. So we talk about what you should do in these different phases of retirement right? while saving for, and then in your mid career phase and then early retirement and then later stage retirement. So very life cycle oriented, have gotten great, great feedback from that. Uh, they're very different. The lecture series, you learn a lot. You can listen to it like a podcast. The book has a lot of schedules and examples in it. So if you're a spreadsheet type of person, people will take the book and then go out and, and build their own spreadsheets off some of the models in the book. So you can go, I mean, get on the wait list. Why wouldn't you? There's no, no, no cost to do that. Get on the newsletter list. Start, start learning. There's no downside to doing that. Um, Correct. So you know, I would, I would encourage you to do that. And, and they are professionals. They're not going to chase you and ping you and call you. They don't do that. No. Okay. They're pros. I have people on my podcast that kind of are like me, which are, listen, we're going to give you the best information we can. If you want to be a client, a client, that's fine for them. They have a waiting list, but we're not going to, there's not going to be somebody showing up at your doorstep, et cetera. So you get on the Harley and you drive to the pickleball tournament. Now, when I pull up the Pickleball National Championships coming up, am I going to see sensible money Pickleball National Championships? I think I've got a ways to go, but that would be <laughs> kind of fun. You're giving me the idea here to sponsor something like that. that I don't think fun. that's a bad idea, Dana, um, especially right. maybe the, uh, you know, the warm-up suit. Um, as you're warming up ha is a pick, you know, of course I'm logoed out, Dana, as I, just, for the people on the podcast that can't see it, I just held up all of my logos and Dana laughs at me because everything I wear is logoed, but I want the sensible money pickleball tournament t-shirt sent to me double extra large when that happens. I mean, why wouldn't you sponsor that Dana in Scottsdale, Arizona? Really, really good idea, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a marketer, you know, I'm, I'm a marketer. I'm a brander. Um, these markets are crazy, as you know, and volatile, as you know, but they always are crazy and volatile, as you know. Um, yes. What are you keeping your eyes on that may, that, that's not the obvious. Obvious stuff is Russia, Ukraine, cryptocurrency, interest rates, midterm elections, inflation, printing of money, and COVID. Throw those out. What are you looking at if there's anything? Yeah, so we look at it so differently. So Good. the typical way that people build portfolios is to minimize risk. And risk is often measured as volatility over a relatively short time period, mm -hmm. three months, you know, a calendar quarter or a year. And so you'll see those risk tolerance questionnaires. If my portfolio was down 10%, I would not be concerned. I would call my advisor. I would jump off a bridge. And so we don't like those risk tolerance right, questionnaires. Right. We've never thought that they, they provided much useful information. Instead, if you look at, it's at risk as measured over your lifetime, you can create a portfolio that has, you know, I've, PIMCO has new material on it that I love. They call it the income paycheck replacement portfolio and the growth portfolio. Okay. And so your paycheck replacement portfolio might be funded with six to eight years worth of cash flow that you need that is intended to replace your regular paycheck, direct deposited to you, just sure. like your paycheck was. And your growth portfolio is intended to have volatility just as mm -hmm. we're discussing and then when it when in the volatility works to your advantage when it's up right we think of it as negative but when sure. it's upside volatility you sell some of it and you use that to replace some of what's been withdrawn from the paycheck replacement portfolio when you do that you can start to step back and build this growth portfolio from a well what would have held up the best over a seven to 15 year time frame. Mm -hmm. So instead of being concerned about risk over a calendar quarter or a single year, I don't have to worry about that. I have my paycheck replacement portfolio. It's gonna cover me for, for eight years. Now, how do I build my equity portfolio for something that if we got the worst decade in equities, this equity portfolio 
would still have held up better than others. And when you look at that allocation mix, it is a very different mix than what reduces volatility on shorter timeframes. So if shorter timeframes, asset classes like real estate and commodities and gold mm -hmm. will add a lot of value in minimizing short-term volatility. But when you look at volatility over longer time periods, they don't add value. Things that, that hold up better in bad time periods over long time frames are things like small cap value, uh, emerging markets, international small cap value. So it leads to a very different mix. So when you, you know, think about what we're looking at, we're always looking at, is it the right time to sell some of our growth portfolio and replenish some mm -hmm. of what's gone into our, our paycheck replacement, some of what's come out of that? We did a lot of that in 2021. And now things have already recovered amazingly well from, from the volatility at the start of the, the Russia invasion. Mm -hmm. And so once again, we're looking at, okay, now could be a good time to sell some growth and, and replenish. Sure. And that's what we focus on is that process of when nice. is it the right time to, to replenish that paycheck portfolio. Forget black swan. It's called sensible swan investing. I just <laughs> trademarked that by the way. Nice. <laughs> Dana, it's, I mean, obviously it's, it's always time flies when we talk. I mean, we were, we were discussing, what are we going to talk about? I don't know. Let's just talk. I mean, we always, we always just kind of go down the path and it makes so much sense and people love when you're on. But as you know, at the very end of every podcast, I do something called the mic drop moment so that I'm going to throw you the mic, you're going to catch it, and then you're going to say something unbelievable as we go out of this program, and then you're going to drop it. So mic drop moment, throw the mic to Dana Onspach, superstar. Dana, go. I am going to win a pickleball tournament in 2023. That's it? <laughs> Sounds good to me. Listen, um, I really appreciate you being on the Fun with Annuities podcast, which by the way, Dana, it's the number one annuity podcast on the planet, but it's also one of the fastest growing financial podcasts on the planet. And you know why? It's because we have people like you on that make me look good. And uh, I hope you're going to join us uh, in the future again. I wish you the best with your Harley Davidson riding and your pickleball playing. And I want to thank every single person that's out there listening to us on all major po podcast platforms and watching us on the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel. I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site at theannuityman.com where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get. And that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of. So join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet, Fun with Annuities.